And let's look at these appointments uh, closely with uh, Alison Tilly, who is uh, the Judges Matter Coordinator. Thank you so much for your time this evening. These candidates are likely to face another vigorous process, but another crucial aspect of this is going to be the criteria that will be used by the JSC when conducting these interviews. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, that's exactly right. And, and the difficulty is that not only have the JSC not outlined criteria for uh, high court judges and uh, judicial leadership positions, but there's also no clear criteria against which uh, we can see you know, who best fits them uh, in terms of the appointment of a, of a chief justice. So it, it does create problems. And, you know, some have said that the setting of the criteria could also assist when it comes to some of the inappropriate questions that, they, you know, that may be asked um, during these particular sittings and thus giving the chairperson some kind of hold over the particular process that will then need to ensue in order to appoint the Chief Justice. I wonder... Um, looking at how the process has been over the years, what would you say would constitute some inappropriate questions? Well, I think we've we've certainly seen um, in the last round of interviews for positions for the Constitutional Court uh, in that round, the, the questions being sufficiently inappropriate that the entire round had to be repeated. Mm. And one of the questions there was the uh, former Chief Justice, uh, asking Judge Pele um, about a meeting that Chief Justice Mohueng uh, happened to have with uh, Pravin Gordhan and what impact that had on her uh, as, a, as a candidate and then as a friend of, of Mr. Gordhan. And, and that was certainly one of the things that actually meant that that whole series of interviews had to be set aside and, and redone. So I think we know that for, for sure. And we've, we've also seen uh, other issues around, for example, political hot potatoes. So questions around Palestine, for example, that some JSCs have allowed and other JSCs have said that those questions can't be asked because they are uh, very political in nature. Mm. And would you say then that this process, you know, given what we've seen and what you've just alluded to as well, may be used by some as almost like an ego boosting um, exercise? Well, I think we, we, we certainly do see um, a, a number of the, the, the uh, people on the JSC asking very long questions and, and being asked again and again by the chair to try and keep the questions short. I also think there's some the inappropriate questions that go around individual members of parliament who have a grief against a particular judge because of a judgment they handed down a grievance, or whether they um, perhaps have a case pending that they're litigating and they want to get a free opinion um, from the judge. So we've certainly seen uh, interviews go in, in really unexpected ways that really don't say anything about whether or not you're going to be a good judge or a good chief justice. Uh, Alison, some have said impeccable leadership, a strong administrative track record, and, integ and as well as integrity, are going to be key for the candidate that is going to be uh, chief justice. But also, when one looks at, uh, you know, the, the, the past and, and this particular office, it's also going to be important for that particular individual to not only embody these particular characters, but they also need to ensure that those that they work with within the judicial service as a whole also adhere to these. I think that that's something that we're keenly aware of um, over the chief justiceship. Um, of Chief Justice Mukhwain. This is not just somebody who writes judgments, although, you know, extremely important as that is. Um, it's somebody who has to lead the courts and not just the constitutional court, but the higher courts and indeed the magistracy. And uh, it's, it's a huge undertaking and a, one in which the rules aren't necessarily as clear as they should be. It's a process that was started um, by Justice Snowball, but um, less focused on by, by Justice McQueen. So 
I think that's, you know, that's something that we, we really are going to be needing in the, in the years ahead is a really strong guiding hand in terms of, of being able to manage this very complex system. Should it be somebody that, um, you know, is, is not afraid of being extroverted, as we've seen, uh, you know, the former Chief Justice Mukhweng Mukhweng being in the public domain talking about some of the controversial comments uh, that uh, we even, uh, you know, saw about Israel and all of that? Or do you think this needs somebody introverted who may just be focusing on this particular office, especially given, you know, when you look at the fact that they also need to balance uh, policy making at the same time and also representing this office in some high profile gatherings it's a lot isn't it mm. um i think what we what we saw with, with chief justice Mukhwang, uh, who's now being ordered to apologize again for the for the comments he made is that that he was very uh, comfortable speaking outside of court and speaking about issues that were were dear to his heart and he, he would he was really uh, reluctant to to concede that um, perhaps he was he was doing so too often on, and on too many things. Um, you know, we we sometimes we say judges should speak through their judgments, and um, colleagues have pointed out to me that of course you know judges are, are entitled to to speak about the law. Uh, they can write articles. There's nothing um, to prevent a judge from from doing something like that. But it does seem as though the discretion is the better part of valor uh, when it comes to being a very senior judge, and in particular, the chief justice. You never know what kinds of cases are going to come before your court. You never want to have to accuse yourself because of, uh, you know, an intemperate speech that, that you may have given at a, at a bad moment. So let's let's look at the two candidates that we're talking about tonight. Uh, now, the acting chief justice has about three years left uh, or so, and uh, with uh, Justice Madlanga, around about four years left. And we saw this uh, with the former chief justice Ngobo leaving before his time. Do you think time uh, may be a factor here because they do have that non-renewable term that comes into effect in the constitutional court? Mm. I think that's a very really important factor. Um, we are in a position where the, the judiciary have been, frankly, drifting a little, and uh, there does need to be a lot of work done on some things that are as straightforward as making sure courts have working Wi-Fi, uh, you know, making sure that, that pleadings can be filed online, uh, right through to thinking about the career path of magistrates. Uh, into the judiciary and whether that's an appropriate issue or not. So all of these th things can really, I think, only be dealt with on a, on a longer term basis, on a, on a plan that would be a five-year plan or a seven-year plan um, that would allow for really coherence, considered, thought through leadership on, on these issues. So I think a very short term, um, while it certainly might be enough to, to hand down important decisions um, wouldn't necessarily be ideal if, if, that's, if that's the criteria that you're looking for. So some say that uh, seniority and holding the position of Deputy Chief Justice may put one in good stead here, but we've seen a different scenario in the past, as, as, especially when you look at the former Deputy Chief Justice Dekhang Mosenek is concerned, but others are saying that uh, the tide might turn here and uh, the acting Chief Justice may just be in a good position. What are your thoughts there? And I think the question of seniority is one that, that lawyers are very fond of, of, of holding on to. Um, it's, it's very much a, a profession that, that respects uh, your experience and how many years you've been in the profession. And, you know, many small courtesies are, are uh, made in order to uh, defer to your seniors. So it is, it is an important part of the tradition um, of, of the legal profession. But as you say, uh, the... Uh, Justice Mosineke was not appointed and, and was overlooked as the, as the uh, Deputy Chief Justice at the time. And we've certainly had in other courts uh, in the Supreme Court of Appeal, more junior judges being appointed to lead those, those courts. So it's not an absolute rule. Um, it, it's difficult sometimes, I think, to bring in a, a 
very much more junior person because they simply, you know, they you you need you need quite a lot of personal uh, charisma and uh, authority, personal authority to lead in a judicial position. Mm. And that can be difficult for somebody who's who's really more junior. And looking at uh, Justice Madlanga, some say that he's a very strong contender and they, you know, they cite his, uh, you know, uh, track record when it comes to some written judgments, as we heard there in that particular piece by my colleague Mercedes Percent. And they say that some of the judgments that he's actually penned may signal a strong intellectual leader who is needed at a time like this in, in the judiciary. I wonder what are your thoughts? around that argument if only if only we knew for sure what the JSC was was going to consider as the most important criteria I mean the the ability of of a judge to to lead in the constitutional court and to make sure that the decisions that are handed down uh, are consistent and develop the constitution it's it's incredibly important um, it's not the only uh, criteria by, by which uh, we weigh a, a chief justice, but certainly I think um, Justice, justice Midlanga has, um, has certainly made a name for himself as, as a jurist and somebody who hands down decisions that, that are very important and guide our, our jurisprudence in, in important areas. Mm. So that, again, is a, is a very good argument in favour for in favour of his appointment. As a final question, uh, I, I mean, the person that ultimately becomes appointed, as we've alluded to a little earlier on in this discussion, is going to have quite a lot of work in their hands, especially to ensure that things go smoothly. Apart from the administrative work, apart from the Wi-Fi and all of that, there's also that all-important conversation around the judgments that are delaying. And that really is one of the things that they need to look into as a matter of urgency. Mm. I think that the question of delayed judgments, which was one which uh, Chief Justice Wilkerson really emphasised the importance to litigants of, of having judgments handed down quickly. And it was a consistent theme uh, in, in JSC interviews. I'm not sure that it's quite so important in, in relation to the, the Chief Justice because sitting on the Concord as they do, um, you would you would have decisions that are made uh, by the justices um, collectively or sometimes with with one or two members disagreeing. Um, but there are certain decisions that have been very delayed even by the Constitutional Court, and that's that's obviously something that that you know one one really doesn't like to see. It's not in line with the uh, the criteria the um, that that are laid out in terms of how how quickly judgment should be handed down. Well, Alison, I think you and I are going to have very little activity outside of our homes this week as we sit and watch those interviews very closely. I cannot wait to have a conversation with you at the end of it all to see how everything panned out. But thank you so much for your time this afternoon. That was uh, Alison Tilly. She's uh, the coordinator at Judges Matter.